Sometime in the 70s, the early 70s, I was at Sweet Smell, a, uh, an old logging camp that was a music um, camp for the Fresno Folklore Society. And uh, Warren Argo and Chuck Plisky took us there, our whole house. She wandered by a building, the windows were open, and she heard this most wonderful music coming out the windows. Strange, eerie, compelling music. She wandered in and it was a Sacred Harp workshop. And I just stuck myself down in it as close as I could and listened to it until they were exhausted and were willing to answer some questions. Where do I get more of this? And he said, I don't know. He said, I have this book uh, called The Sacred Harp. And they told me about how I could buy the books from a guy named Hugh McGraw. Uh, for, for, for more books, you know, write to Bremen, Georgia. And he wrote back saying, yes, you can get books. They're 350 If you want t uh, five or 10, you can have them for 250 a piece. And it was the 1971 edition of the Denson Sacred Harp. I lived at that time in a house. We called the big house and it was full of uh, hippie kids, all, most of whom played music, and some of them were very good and in bands, like the Gypsy Jippo String Band, and some of them danced and sang in Radost. Every, everybody in the house was, uh, well, almost everybody was, was an eager folk music enthusiast of one kind or another. So when the really gifted music people were off doing things, the rest of us would get up the courage to play our instruments. I thought maybe I could get these guys to try these songs. So I passed out the Xeroxes and we sang them. And we loved them. And we found little bits of, uh, of uh, evidence of how they should be sung. And the very first Pacific Northwest folk life began to be planned. Reed, of course, and the others in the house were right in the thick of it. And they said, we need to, we need to work up some songs. And we called ourselves the Total Immersion Godless Anarchist Sacred Harp Shape Note Choir. We thought that would set everybody straight. But then we thought, well, that's pretty cheeky. And we, uh, the next year we kind of fumbled around and had one of those conversations and out of it bubbled the idea of the sacred cow. Harmogenizers! And sacred harp shape note music has been a part of folk life every year since. And yeah, at the time it was, we met once a month in people's living rooms and, and sometime in early spring we would gear up for folk life. And in those days people did things like when they sang we lay our garments by upon our beds to rest, certain persons would remove their clothes and throw them in the middle. Because everybody that, sung, that sang the, the song, the shape note songs in the Seattle group, in the Sacred Cows, nobody uh, was a believer. So everybody, mo most people, just sang it because they loved the harmonies. And they would either tolerate the religion that went along with it or kind of think of it as metaphor. I first was told about Sacred Heart by my brother in 1988-89. I no longer remember exactly when it was. He had just gotten home from attending the Midwest Convention in Chicago. He didn't even take his jacket off. He walked into his door, he picked up his phone, he called me and said, Karen, I bought you a book. I bought a cassette tape. It's going in the mail to you tomorrow. I talked to the guy that prints these books. He says he sold many cases of books to people in Seattle. You've got to find these people and start singing with them. An important thing is that for like 15 years we sang not knowing much about the tradition and then we got Willardized. Karen Willard showed up. I've been singing with uh, the folks in Seattle in the living rooms. I came back from my first convention uh, and I said, you know, everyone else waves their arms and beats time when they sing. Now, the, the singers in the living room in Seattle 
didn't sit in parts. You just kind of sat around. The, the sacred cows in, I guess, about 1990, 1991, they, 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 people were starting to drift away and do other things, and the group was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And somehow that coincided with Karen Willard arriving on the scene, uh, who told us about this, that there were these singing conventions, and, and there was this whole network. They, they didn't know about us. We didn't know about them. Um, we didn't know that it was still a living tradition anywhere. We thought, well, okay, people do this in the South, maybe. Um, it seemed to us then, in the late 80s, that this was a precious folkway that was being eroded. And again, like any human passion that you fall desperately in love with, you tend to get a little bit um, anal about it. And again, religious language works very well here. Um, my brother and I became hyper-Orthodox. Uh, if you didn't do it right, then we were going to treat you with scorn and, and try and set you on the, the narrow road to salvation instead of walking that broad highway to, to, to hell. Uh, and don't hurt Sacred Heart by your casual, carefree, careless behavior. So Karen introduced us to that. She was the one who organized our first convention in 1992. Um, we had Hugh McGraw and Richard DeLong come and do the singing school. Which but it wasn't until Karen Willard showed up and connected us with the South and we started going to the South to sing with people there and bringing Southerners up here to sing with us um, and give uh, singing schools at our conventions and major singings and stuff that we actually approached sounding like that, you know. Now our sound is pretty good. Now our sound is pretty authentic. Hallelujah, free.